Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 67 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about numbers stations. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So, folks, after the First World War broke out in 1914, a mysterious new kind of radio station began to appear. Radio itself had only been around for a few years, and it was a new and strange medium, and the stations that had began appearing in World War I were particularly strange. They transmitted only numbers. These number stations have been with us ever since, providing endless mystery for the hobbyists who listen to them. And that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So first, Jimmy, this is a, a patron's episode, right? Yes, as usual, every month we give our patrons a choice of what they like to hear about, and this month they wanted to hear about number stations, so that's what we'll be talking about. Okay, so what led up to the first numbers stations? Since ancient times, people had been aware of two apparently different forces, electricity and magnetism. But in 1873, the Scottish scientist James Clerk Maxwell proposed that electricity and magnetism are really manifestations of the same force, which we now call electromagnetism. He developed a set of equations that implied the existence of mysterious electromagnetic waves that would radiate through space. And these so-called radio waves were discovered by the German physicist Heinrich Hertz in 1886. That's why Heinrich Hertz has a scientific unit named after him. The number of hertz a frequency represents is the number of cycles per second it has. So if a uh, if something has a frequency of three cycles per second, then it's three hertz. Then in 1895, the Italian inventor Guglielmo Marconi developed a way to transmit radio messages across long distances. At first, these weren't voice transmissions. They transmitted clicks like Morse code. And this was called wireless telegraphy because it lets you do what a telegraph could do, but without having the sender and the receiver connected by wires. In 1900, the Canadian Reginald Fessenden made the first audio transmission over a distance of a whole mile. <laughs> this was then wireless telephony because you could do the same thing as a telephone, but with no wires between the sender and the receiver. And on Christmas Eve 1906, Fessenden made the first public radio broadcast. New experimental radio stations were being set up all over the world. And then in 1914, Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated, and World War I broke out, and the first number stations started to appear. So who first discovered the number stations? The first person we know about, there may have been others, but the first one we know about is uh, the Archduke Anton Habsburg of Austria. He was born in 1901, and as a little boy in the royal family, he became a radio enthusiast. He got a radio set and he learned Morse code. Then as a teenager in World War I, he stumbled across these weird stations that weren't transmitting sensible messages. They were only transmitting numbers. Uh, he'd found the first number stations and there would be many more over the years. And number stations are still with us today. Yes, and to give you a sample of them, we're going to listen to some clips. 
Actually, we've already heard some because the clip we opened this episode with was taken from three different number stations. The first station is perhaps the most famous number station of all, and it's known as the Lincolnshire Poacher. This is what it sounds like. I've actually compressed this message to keep it short. The whole recording I had was more than four and a half minutes long, but that gives you a sense of what the Lincolnshire Poacher sounds like. Why is it called the Lincolnshire Poacher? That's the name of the folk tune that begins each message. Uh, We have no idea what the owners of the station called it, but ham radio enthusiasts recognized the folk tune, the Lincolnshire Poacher, and they use that as a nickname for the station. It sounds like the audio was structured in a particular way with different elements of music and numbers. What what do you can you say about that? The Lincolnshire Poacher message had a very definite structure. It began with a series of repetitions of the folk tune. Uh, then it had a block of five numbers: three, nine, seven, one, and five that it repeated. We played you two repetitions of that, but the actual message had ten repetitions of that block. Then there was a series of six tones or chimes alternating between high and low tones. Next followed a series of number blocks again. These were also five numbers long. The first block was 66475, but this time each number block was only repeated twice, not ten times, and then a new block would be given. Then we heard the six high and low tones or chimes again. And finally, the Lincolnshire Poacher folk tune began playing once more. There's significance, obviously, to this structure, and we'll be talking about that later. Was that an automated recorded voice speaking the numbers? Yes, and that's common on number stations. There used to be ones that had people reading the numbers, but today they all use an automated voice. In this case, it was an automated voice of a woman speaking in English with a British accent. And and are there stations that did things differently than that? Yeah. For example, here's a recording of a station called Ready Ready. Ready, ready, one, five, seven, two, eight. You can hear how this one is different. Instead of a folk tune, a woman just says, ready, ready. At the start of the message, she then said one, five, seven, two, eight. And she says it a bunch of times more than the two we played. Then she says, ready, ready again. And then she starts reading a string of numbers that aren't structured the same way the Lincolnshire Poacher message was. Also, even though the woman is speaking in English, she doesn't have a pure British accent. She sounds like a woman from a European country who studied British English. Do we ever get American accents? Yeah, here's a recording from a station called Cynthia. Zero, five, zero, four, two, five, two, zero, six, four, nine, three, zero, two, 
There's not as much structure in the recording I had, so I only used a short clip from Cynthia, but you get the idea. And do all number stations have a voice reading numbers? No. Sometimes they would use Morse code. Other times it would be a voice, either male or female, either human or automated, but they would be using what's called the radio alphabet, also known as the NATO phonetic alphabet or the spelling alphabet. In this alphabet, you replace each letter with a word starting with the same letter. So ABC becomes Alpha Bravo Charlie. Uh, The purpose of using a word instead of a letter is that it's harder to hear a letter correctly, especially over staticky shortwave, than it is to hear a word, which gives you more context to figure out what's being said. For example, if I said the string MNMNMN, you'd have a harder time hearing me correctly than if I said Mike November, Mike November, Mike November. You can also find other formats for number stations, such as one of my favorite stations, Yosemite Sam. On this station, you get a 0.8 seconds data burst followed by Yosemite Sam saying, Varmint, I'm going to blow you to smithereens, which is a clip from the 1949 cartoon Bunker Hill Bunny. (laughs) A Yosemite Sam transmission sounds like this. Be sure to listen for the data burst before Yosemite Sam speaks. And because the data burst precedes the voice clip, I want to play that again. So first you'll hear static, then you'll hear the data burst, then you'll hear Yosemite Sam. So let's play that again. Okay. Do you get audio sampling like that much on number stations? Occasionally. For example, there's a station called Magnetic Fields because it uses music that's a sound clip from the French electronic musician Jean-Michel Jarre's recording of a tune called Magnetic Fields that he wrote. And uh, there are numbers stations that broadcast using languages other than English? Oh, yeah. I've been focusing on English language stations here because I know our listeners speak English. But number stations broadcast in a variety of languages. Uh, They include Russian, Chinese, German, Spanish, and others. And that's given rise to a way that number stations are identified. There's a group called the European Numbers Information Gathering and Monitoring Association, or ENIGMA for short, and they began assigning an ENIGMA ID to each known number station. Each Enigma ID begins with a letter prefix that tells you what type of broadcasting the station done. Each Enigma ID begins with a letter prefix which tells you what kind of broadcasting a station does. E means it broadcasts in English. For example, E01 is the ID for Ready Ready, and E03 is the ID for the Lincolnshire Poacher. G is used for stations broadcasting in German. S is used for stations broadcasting in a Slavic language, such as Russian. V is used to indicate various languages, so, you know, all other languages. M is used for stations broadcasting in Morse code. And X is used for noise-based transmission stations, such as polytones, like a data burst, for example. There's another type of station besides number stations, per se. That you wanted to mention. What is that? There's a class of station that transmits the same thing over and over again. One example, which is sometimes classified as a number station, is a Russian language station called the buzzer. It's called that because most of the time it just transmits an annoying buzzing tone over and over again, like this. Quote Mr. T, I pity the fool who's assigned to listen to that all the time because most of the time that's all you hear. 25 tones a minute, 24 hours a day. Not really engaging radio. (laughs) Occasionally, though, the buzzer will transmit something in a live voice speaking in Russian. For example, in 1997, 
The following brief message was transmitted, and here we'll read it in English so people have a better idea what's being said. Yeah, UVB 76. Yeah, UVB 76. 18008 Bromall 74279914. Boris, Roman, Olga, Mikhail, Anna, Larissa. 74279914. So UVB-76 was the buzzer's official call sign at the time. It later changed. And in that message, you can hear the word bromol is first given and then spelled out in the Russian phonetic alphabet, Boris, Roman, Olga, Mikhail, Anna, Larissa. They have their own, you know, they don't do Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. They have their own version of that. Then you have a repeat of the numbers. Initially, they were given in two number pairs, like 74, 27, 99, 14, or however they said that. And then they were said as individual numbers instead of two group, uh, instead of two number groups. This suggests that the important information is given first in brief form, like bromol or the two number groups, and then spelled out more slowly to make sure it's accurately understood. In addition to the buzzer, there's a whole other class of stations that transmit the same thing over and over all the time, apparently without additional voice broadcasts. Uh, these are known as letter beacons, and they were first discovered in the 1960s. Instead of transmitting numbers with voice, they transmit letters in Morse code. In his book, Big Secrets, Author William Poundstone writes, Dozens of low-power stations transmit only a letter of Morse code endlessly. No one, including government agencies and the International Telecommunications Union, admits to knowing where the signals are coming from, who is sending them, or why. K dash dot dash is the most common letter. Letters are repeated every two to seven seconds, depending on the station. The stations never identify themselves. The frequency used for the broadcast shifts slowly with time. These sta stations broadcast mostly during the night hours of North America. They are most often picked up in North America, Australia, and the Orient, but because of the easy propagation of shortwave signals, no one is sure where they're coming from. And letter beacons are particularly mysterious because transmitting a single letter over and over doesn't contain any obvious information. So the, the amateur radio or ham radio community discovered number stations decades ago and has been studying them. What have they been able to find out? Number station enthusiasts would study the behavior of a given number station over time and see how it changed to see what they could figure out about it. And there's a website that catalogs this type of information. It's called numbers-stations.com or numbers hyphen stations.com. We'll refer to this uh, website more, and I'm just going to say numberstations.com, but remember there's a, a hyphen in there. Here's part of what they had to say about our friend the Lincolnshire Poacher, or EO3. Voice summary. Automated woman's voice. Very cheery sounding. Inflection in voice would go up for last numbers in a group. Early transmissions were made by a male, and the music was played non-electronically. Station summary. Perhaps one of the best-known examples of a numbers station. Early reports show evidence that E03 had existed since the 1970s and possibly earlier with a different setup. At the time, the Lincolnshire Poacher used a male voice and non-electronic music, transmitting in AM mode. It was a common victim of heavy jamming attempts. E03 was also once featured on BBC Radio 1, where recording samples from the station were played on the air. At the beginning of the hour, E03 would appear with its opening interval music, the first verse of an English folk tune known as the Lincolnshire Poacher, played to sound like a calliope machine. After the music played, the female-voiced machine would identify who the message was for with a five-digit call-up. The message was announced by three chimes, and the voice would read 200 message groups. All E03 transmissions lasted for 45 minutes. Transmissions would appear every day of the week from 1200 to 2200 UTC. The voice itself was unique to most number stations. Unlike most with voices that were obviously robotic, E03 had a lifelike manner in which it read its messages. The last two numbers in each group would go up in pitch. Transmissions were sent simultaneously on three different frequencies. 
This was due to the jamming attempts that often happened during E-03 broadcasts. Rumored jammings, jammings of the station were said to be originated from Iran. E-03 transmissions were last logged in the summer of 2008, and its sister, E-03A, XE-04, ceased a year later. The last logs of E-03 were on July 2nd and possibly on July 3rd of 2008. So E-03, or the Lincolnshire Poacher, is no longer active. But this is a good bit of what was known about it when it was active. So what are the theories about the number stations? To compose our list of theories, let's put on our Sherlock Holmes hat and see what we can deduce about number stations. There are a number of pertinent facts that we want to consider. There is the fact that, except for outliers like the buzzer and the letter beacons, traditional number stations are clearly transmitting information that varies over time, as illustrated by the fact that the contents of the messages change. They also transmitted in code, whose obvious purpose is to keep it secret. They're not transmitting a huge amount of information, just brief messages. It's not like they're sending image files over number stations one bit at a time. That would take forever. So these are very short messages of uh, textual nature. They're encoded text. The messages also are one way. We're not hearing conversations between different parties on a given channel. And the stations are linguistically and geographically diverse, so it's a worldwide phenomenon. And neither the senders nor the receivers of the message are willing to openly identify themselves. So using these facts, let's ask ourselves a question. What type of people exist worldwide who want to keep their identities secret and also want to send short, one-way, secret messages to people whose identities also aren't publicly known. I can think of two potential groups, criminals and spies. Other groups that have secrets, like legitimate commercial businesses, don't fit in here. Uh, they may have trade secrets, but they don't broadcast them to the world in code. So I think we're really looking at two groups, criminals and spies, as our potential number station operators. Okay, let's use the reason perspective to see what more we can deduce. What is there? The fact that there's so much secrecy surrounding number stations means that the activity is itself covert, either because it's straight out criminal or would be considered criminal in nations where the receivers of the messages are. That fits both ordinary criminals like drug smugglers and it fits spies. The fact that the messages are one way suggests that they are ordinarily instructions sent to agents of some kind. Again, that could be either criminals or spies. A drug overlord could be sending instructions to pick up or drop off materials or money to agents in his gang. A spy agency could be sending instructions to field agents in their employ. Either way, it looks like the messages are instructions sent by a higher authority to lower agents so that they can carry them out. But there's one more thing we know about number stations, which we've already mentioned, which we already mentioned. They were invented in wartime. Remember the teenage Archduke Anton Habsburg in World War I? Well, as soon as he discovered number stations, he deduced that they were being used as part of military intelligence by Austria's opponents in the war. He it was picking up transmissions from Paris and Italy and Russia, uh, and he would copy down 30 pages, of 30 pages a day of code by hand that he heard on these number stations. He then, since he was a teenager, he was going to school, and he'd drop off the pages he copied at the war office on his way home from school and give them to the radio operator there saying, well, I can't use it, not knowing the key, but if you can use it, and, you know, if not, throw it away. Then there's the fact that the peak of number station activity was in another war, the Cold War. And after that, it started to drop off. So we have good evidence that number stations are part of international espionage activity. I can't rule out that some criminals may use similar techniques. In fact, you know, spy agencies often partner with drug cartels. So the two might be working hand in glove in some cases. 
but the major purpose of number stations is espionage. Their purpose is to establish a one-way voice link between headquarters and agents in the field. Back in 1999, Salon Magazine reported, A rare mainstream media article about number stations published in the Daily Telegraph last year quoted a spokesman for the Department of Trade and Industry responsible for regulating the airwaves in the UK. Quote, These number stations are what you suppose they are. People shouldn't be mystified by them. They are not for, shall we say, public consumption. End quote. A uh, typical British understatement, by the way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the solution to at least the core of the mystery is known. These are these are spy broadcasts. So what can we say about this topic from the faith perspective? The Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2489, says this. The good and safety of others, respect for privacy, and the common good are sufficient reasons for being silent about what ought to not be known or for making use of a discreet language. No one is bound to reveal the truth to someone who does not have the right to know it. So using code is just an extreme form of discreet speech. It's like extra discreet. <laughs> and and it can be legitimately used to keep from revealing the truth to someone who doesn't have a right to know it. So in principle, number stations are morally legitimate. Now, that doesn't mean that all spycraft is moral. Obviously, that is not the case. And in future episodes, we're going to talk about some spycraft that went off the rails, morally speaking. But number stations aren't, in principle, in conflict with the faith. Is, is there more that can be said about this mystery? Oh, yeah, there certainly is. We can pull back the curtain a little further. Earlier, to keep from prematurely discussing the purpose of number stations, I omitted part of what numberstations.com said about the Lincolnshire poacher. By techniques such as radio triangulation and on-site observation, hams were able to learn more about it. Here's what I previously omitted. The original Lincolnshire poacher transmitted from Her Majesty's Government Communication Center in Gawket, near Buckinghamshire, in England, in AM mode. The Lincolnshire poacher we know today transmitted from a large military site in Cyprus, emitting in upper sideband mode. Although it was originally thought to be transmitted from Egypt, this was never the case. Yeah, so they were able to find out a good bit about the Lincolnshire poacher and specifically where it was broadcasting from. But not as much is known about every number station. For example, here's what the website has to say about Ready Ready or E01. E01 had many theories as to who operated it and where it came from. Besides Bulgaria, there have been claims that came from Italy and even the USA. Due to a concept called the endings rule, people assumed since E01 had the same ending, all transmissions finished when the machine read end as the CIA's number stations, so it could belong to them. Though it appeared to have been an English sister to Bulgarian language number station S02, and both stations shared the same frequencies. So Ready Ready went off the air in 1999, and we don't really have a good handle on who is running it. At least the public doesn't. Uh, you know, the CIA might know, but they haven't said. Mm -hmm. Hams were never able to figure out exactly where it was coming from. One station, though, that is believed to have been American is Cynthia. In fact, her nickname is a reference to who is believed to be behind her, the CIA. You just add an inth to CIA to turn it into Cynthia. And here's what numberstations.com has to say about Cynthia or E05. Early reports of E05 can be traced to the 1970s. E05 was one of the English language stations maintained by the CIA's network, thus E05 earning the nickname Cynthia. The voice employed was very professional in its work, having an obvious American accent. Transmission schedules at E05's height transmitted every day in upper sideband mode, and a very strong signal sometimes more powerful than the AM broadcasts around it. At the end of E05's existence, over 100 regular frequencies were logged for it, being relayed from various countries allied with the U.S. When transmissions began, a distinctive background noise was heard behind the voice machine due to high traffic. The noise itself could be described as the sound of rushing air. And Cynthia went off the air in 2003, so it's no longer with us either. So how did number stations' messages work? 
It depends on the station in question. They would use different, obviously different codes, but also different structures for the messages. But there were some commonalities. Uh, Numberstations.com has a general explanation. Each station is usually given a name depending on what is included in the broadcast. For example, G03 is given the name gongs or chimes since its intro and outro signal includes the sounds of gongs. Many more stations do not have nicknames since they do not include anything specific that differentiate them from one another. Almost all number stations include a few common elements, which are the ID, group count, and message. The ID is the group of numbers that indicates who the message is intended for. The group count is how many groups of four or five digit numbers that are sent in the message. And the message is what the recipient is ultimately going to decode to get his or her orders from. Every transmission usually has an intro or end phrase, such as end or will just end with numbers, for example, 000000. Many number stations are well known because of the music that they play. This has become less popular with today's number stations, but there are still a few such as E25 or V13 that use them. There were also used to be more stations that read their numbers with a live voice, but now there are no, station, no more stations like this. Voices that are synthesized and created by machines are used instead. So in the case of the Lincolnshire Poacher, you'd hear the folk tune as an attention signal indicating the start of the message. Then you'd hear the metadata for the message, a single repeating five number block that tells you who the message is for and other information you might need to decode it. Then they had the chimes to separate the metadata from the message itself. Then you would got the message containing the instructions and then there would be an end signal, which I believe was also the chimes in the case of the Lincolnshire Poacher, before the folk tune starts. Where did they get the codes that are used in the message? Numberstations.com explains. Number stations are used to transmit coded messages to spies and are encrypted with a one-time pad. For the use of a one-time pad, there is no way to decode the message that is transmitted. Only the person who has a copy of the one-time pad would be able to decode the message. This allows for complete anonymity, which is why it is used for covert operations. With the message being sent through a shortwave broadcast, the message can be heard from long distances, and the identity of the people involved in the operations is kept secret. The one-time pad is only used once and destroyed after use to maintain its security. Yeah, so a one-time pad is a classic tool of spycraft. Um People will be familiar with standard substitution ciphers. The most famous is the Caesar cipher, which was used by Julius Caesar. According to the Roman historian Suetonius, if Caesar had anything confidential to say, he would encrypt it by backing up three letters in the alphabet. For example, if Caesar wanted to write the letter D in his message, he'd back up three letters and write A instead. Or if he wanted to write E, he'd back up three letters and write B, and so on. That way, you just by looking at his text, you wouldn't know what he was saying unless you knew that he's backing up three letters each time. The problem with simple substitution ciphers is they're extremely easy to crack. Any schoolboy can do it with trial and error, since there are only 25 possible ciphers for a language with a 26-letter alphabet. Uh, a much stronger cipher is made, though, if you don't do a simple substitution cipher like back up three letters. Instead, you want to change how many letters you go backwards or forwards with each letter you're encrypting. And you want the pattern to be random so it's unpredictable. Uh, what you want to do is write a cipher key that is at least as long as the message you want to encode. Let's say, a cipher key that fills an entire sheet of paper so it can encode any message or encrypt any message you can write on a sheet of paper. You then need to share the cipher key with your agent who will be decoding the message. But you don't want to use the same key over and over again because if you use it more than once, it'll generate patterns that can be cracked. So what you want is not a single sheet of paper with a cipher key. You want a pad of paper where each sheet has a different random cipher key. You give a copy of this pad to the agent, and then whenever you send him a secret message, 
both you and he tear off the top sheet and destroy it so it doesn't get used again accidentally. A pad meant to be used this way is called a one-time pad because you only use each cipher key once. One-time pads were thought up in 1882 by a cryptographer named Frank Miller, and they're still in use today. They're considered uncrackable, even by quantum computing techniques, as long as you don't use a key from the pad more than once. Have we ever cracked transmissions by number stations? Yes, it's actually happened at least a couple of times, and we caught the people involved. For example, in 1995, the FBI entered a Cuban spy's apartment and copied the computer program he used to decrypt messages from the Cuban number station Atencion, so-called because it uses the word Atencion as an attention signal in its messages. In 1998, they brought his spy network up on charges and they revealed some of the messages they'd caught him receiving. This gives us a glimpse into the kinds of messages sent by number stations. And what did the messages say? There were three that the government revealed. The first one said, prioritize and continue to strengthen friendship with Joe and Dennis. So Joe and Dennis apparently were some targets of the spies' activities. I guess they would be Americans, and they wanted the spies to buddy up to them more. The second message said, under no circumstances should German nor Castor fly with BTTR or another organization on days 24, 25, 26, and 27. Uh, BTTR is an anti-Cuban or anti-Castro airborne group called Brothers to the Rescue. So that's what okay. BTTR stands for. And apparently German and Castor were some of the agents in the spy network, and they didn't want them flying with Brothers to the Rescue on these days. Then the last of the three messages said, congratulate all the female comrades for the International Day of the Woman. And that's a reference to March 8th, which is International Women's Day. So this is like a morale building thing for female spies on that day. Okay, <laughs> with a coded message. Yeah, uh, which so, someone then had to take the trouble to decrypt. And, I mean, to me, and that, burn a one-time pad. <laughs> yeah, to me that would be a little like using your little orphan Annie decoder ring to just get uh, remember to eat your Ovaltine, <laughs> remember to drink <laughs> your <right>. Ovaltine. <laughs> so you mentioned that number stations have become less common. Why is that? Well, I haven't found any commentary on this, but I think there are likely several reasons. One, the Cold War is over, so international tensions aren't as high. If we get a full-blown new Cold War, presumably um, we'd have more spycraft of this sort, but we have new ways of communicating securely, such as over the Internet. Computers have changed things, so you can encode much more information in a less-than-one-second data burst than you can in a laborious message of spoken numbers. I mean, you could, in a data burst, transmit information like an image file or something that mm -hmm. you could never do, reading the numbers out one at a time. You, you could also do the reverse, which is transmit a message encoded in an image, yes. which is called steganography. Yes. and But in terms of like data burst stations, Yosemite Sam is likely the wave of the future. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, it began broadcasting in 2004, and it uses a 0.8-second data burst followed by its tagline. And so I, I suspect we'll see more stations like Yosemite Sam in the future. One of the benefits to using the radio stations over using the Internet is a radio transmits to everyone, and you can't really track who's receiving it. Right. Whereas on the Internet, both sides are potentially trackable, the, the receiver and the sender. Potentially trackable, though there are ways of evading that too. But yes, right. this is the fact that stations broadcast, mm -hmm. they transmit broadly, is one of the reasons that, uh, that this solution was adopted. Because if you have, let's say it's a shortwave station, if you have a shortwave radio, you can pick it up anywhere in the world. And mm -hmm. if someone says, well, why do you have a shortwave radio? Oh, I like shortwave radio. I listen to the BBC or whatever you want to say. 
So is there any mystery left on this subject? Yeah, um, despite the fact that we know what number stations are for, there are still outlier stations like the buzzer and the letter beacons. They don't behave like number stations, so their purpose seems to be different. Now, the buzzer has been reported to be part of the Russian dead hand or perimeter doomsday system, which we talked about in episode 12, way mm -hmm. back there, more yep. than a year ago now. <laughs> But this is disputed by the people at numberstations.com. They say it is not part of Perimeter. In fact, they're, they're suspicious that Perimeter even exists. And they say that the buzzer's real purpose is different. The station works as a communication center within the Russian Western Military District that sends codes to corresponding military units and their outposts. The specific format that the messages are sent in is known in Russian military terminology as monolith messages. They are scrambled messages sent live between the radio communication headquarters and a subordinate military unit. The purpose for these messages varies between testing the readiness of the unit, training, issuing warning messages, and call for mobilization. In theory, the codebook lies in a sealed envelope in a special safe with instructions. Different communication centers have different call signs, codes, and instructions for each military branch. The Russian intelligence agencies, the FSB, GRU, and SVR, don't use such a system. Instead, it uses only numbers. Monoliths are constantly changing. The same monolith could mean a different thing over time. It's not a coded message, but an order. For instance, the Bromol, first recorded message, could mean either full combat readiness or full withdrawal. Yeah, and so that's what they think the buzzer is all about. But we have even less idea what the letter beacons are for. In his book, Big Secrets, William Poundstone writes, An analysis in the confidential frequency list holds that the signals are coming from 25 to 100 watt unattended transmitters somewhere in the South Pacific. An alternate theory places the Morse code beacons in Cuba. It is known that there used to be a W station operating at 3,584 kHz, a frequency supposedly reserved for amateur use. When American amateurs protested to the Federal Communications Commission about the interference, the FCC complained to the Cuban government. The station disappeared shortly thereafter. Actually, all of the beacons must be presumed illegal. Shortwave stations are supposed to be registered with the International Telecommunications Union. None of those, are list of those listed above are. The purpose of the stations is as unclear as their location. A single letter conveys no information. There are legitimate navigational beacon stations which broadcast their call letters, but such stations are registered and operate on fixed frequencies from known locations. Keeping location and frequency information secret would defeat their purpose. Maybe then the letter beacons are navigational stations operated for the benefit of a select few. Some think they're operated by the Soviet Union in Cuba for some military purpose. Still, the globe is cross-hatched with legitimate navigational beacons. It is hard to see what further nav navigational aid the Soviets could expect to derive from their own secret network of beacons. It has also been suggested that the beacon stations are really teletype or other data transmission stations, and that the Morse code letters are just a way of keeping the channel clear between data transmissions. A few of the stations started transmitting some sort of data, audible as a characteristic high-speed typewriter-like sound, in 1980. There are other ways of keeping a data channel open, though. Most radio teletype stations transmit the signal for a space, as between words, or a similar device between transmissions. The radio teletype code is different from Morse code. Finally, still others think the letter transmissions are themselves some sort of coded message. Granted, the letter can't mean anything, but some wonder if the precise length of the interval between the letters means something, or the frequency shifts may hold the message. And there are other proposals, too, including the idea that the letter beacons are used in tracking satellites, that they're used for civil defense purposes, or that they're used by the Russian Navy, especially its submarine branch, to help find the most suitable radio frequency for contact based on current atmospheric conditions in an area. But we're still not sure, so there's mystery here. So, Jimmy, what's the bottom line on the, on the number stations? Number stations are overwhelmingly used for spy agencies to communicate with their agents in foreign countries. Uh, in the radio age, they were particularly useful since anyone who could explain why they had the right kind of radio receiver could listen to them. 
they're less common now and probably will be supplanted by computer technology in the future. We'll still have spy broadcasts, but they'll involve data bursts rather than spoken numbers most of the time. And there's still no consensus about the functions of the buzzer and the letter beacons. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what are the further resources we can offer to our listeners on this topic? Well, there aren't very many nonfiction books that discuss number stations. Um, There are some novels where number stations appear, but there's not a lot written in nonfiction about them. Uh, But I did mention, we mentioned a couple of times, William Poundstone's book, Big Secrets. This was a book I read decades ago that talked about number stations, as well as other secrets that people don't want you to know, like what's actually in the Kentucky Fried Chicken batter. And uh, Poundstone did an analysis, and it is not 11 herbs and spices, despite (laughs) what they say. So he he put all these secrets together in his book, Big Secrets, and we'll have a link to that. It contains sections on number stations and Morse code beacons and a lot of other fascinating stuff. So you may want to get that. Also, we'll have a link to numbers hyphen stations.com where you can read about the individual stations we talked about and hear recordings of them. Uh, We'll have an article on the invention of radio on the NATO phonetic alphabet. We'll have a video on music as used by number stations. Also a link to an article on one time pads and a picture of a one time pad. So you can see an actual like one time pad used by spies. Uh, We'll also have information on the buzzer and on the letter beacons. Excellent. All right. That seems like plenty of resources for those who are interested in following up. Uh, Let's talk about some mysterious feedback from uh, listeners on our previous episodes. Uh, This time we have feedback on the Knights Templar episode. Nicholas on Facebook wrote, This is a great episode for anyone wanting a quick overview of the Templars. I would like to clear up one thing. At one point, Dom mentioned that the Crusaders were second sons and then therefore didn't want to go back to Europe because of the lack of inheritance. Not his exact words. I'm paraphrasing. That's a bit meta, isn't it? Uh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it was a quick statement and the flow of conversation moved right along. However, as the excellent Thomas Madden has pointed out, the Crusaders were in fact dominated by oldest sons. Here's a key quote from one article wherein Madden dispels several Crusader myths. Uh, Quote, new research has definitively shown that Crusaders were predominantly the first sons of Europe, wealthy, privileged, and pious, end quote. And we should note that, and we had a few people uh, mention this, it should be noted that the idea that the Crusaders were dominantly second or later sons actually was thought by historians for like a generation. And it's this new research that disputes that. So um, what Dom was saying was based on scholarly opinion that prevailed for a good bit of time. But we will have a link in Mysterious Headlines to the article that Nicholas links by Thomas Madden. So you can read that for yourself. Yeah, it's probably something I read in uh, Belloc's uh, book, which is from yeah. like the 20s, I think it is. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, and th- those ideas get stuck in my head. So thank you for that correction, Nicholas. Uh, Hayate Laguna on YouTube writes, did Jimmy say Megazord? Was that a Power R- Rangers reference? Yeah, I did say that uh, St. Bernard at the time was super Megazord popular in Europe, and it was a Power <laughs> Rangers reference. I'm, I, I grew up uh, before Power Rangers was around, but I've always had a fondness for... Uh, children's television and movies and cartoons and things like that. So I'm aware of such things, even though I'm from an older group of folks. Uh, Aaron Wood on YouTube writes, Hi, Jimmy, you actually did pretty well with the French names, except for, uh, well, I'll say it the way you might have said it, Troyes, which is pronounced Twa. Yeah, thank you so much, Aaron. It's good to hear this is a language that I have not been able to study in depth, although in looking ahead at future shows, some of the topics we're going to be dealing with involve France quite a bit. And so I've been thinking about, you know, sitting down and buckling down and teaching myself French pronunciation. So hopefully it'll get even better in the future. (laughs) <laughs> and then Francis Lee on YouTube writes, I have a friend from work who's obsessed with anything Templar. I think he would really appreciate and enjoy this, if not learn some really interesting history. He always strikes up this conversation with me, knowing I'm Catholic. He thinks I have some some type of extra knowledge on the subject. He's a bit younger than me in his early 20s. I'm 35, so it's funny when he gets all inquisitive over that stuff. I really just enjoy good conversation, and whenever it involves history, 
I'm never disappointed. Well, thank you, Francis. I hope you were able to share the Templars episode with your friend, and uh, it'd be neat if we heard from him and see what he thought of it. One of the things, as people know, we try to do with Mysterious World is make it very accessible to people from a wide variety of perspectives. And just remember, it's your donations that help us do that. So thank you very much for your generosity. Uh, Jimmy, what do we have for Mysterious Headlines this week? The first one is a link to an article in First Things Magazine by Thomas Madden about the Crusaders and historians, where he talks about the First Sun issue. Also, uh, back in August, there was a mysterious nuclear explosion in Russia. And so we have an article on speculating about what that was. Some people were speculating it may have been another Chernobyl that, uh, you know, another nuclear power plant blew up and they were keeping it secret just like they tried to do after Chernobyl. But actually, some of the speculation that seems maybe better founded is that they were testing a nuclear rocket. That mm -hmm. is a rocket driven by nuclear power, not carrying a nuclear warhead. This kind of rocket is something that has been talked about for a long time, and it would have unlimited range in terms of where it could carry a payload here on Earth. So mm. it may have been they were testing a nuclear rocket and it blew up on them. Then, uh, speaking of places you could go with a nuclear rocket, you could take a nuclear rocket to the outer solar system and study some of the icy ocean moons that are out there. In fact, NASA recently announced that we're going to be sending some probes to those moons. I don't think with nuclear rockets, but we're going to be sending some probes <laughs> there. And so we'll have a link to a Gizmodo article on what would life in an ocean moon look like if we drilled down through the ice and found life there. What might it be like? Interesting. Okay. In a minute, I'll ask Jimmy what our next episode is going to be. But first, I do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Joe S., Mark, Barb G., David F., and Michael D., their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So, Jimmy, what is our next episode going to be about? Next episode, we're going to be talking about something a lot of people have asked us about, uh, requesting an episode on the Flat Earth Theory. Mm, I think I know what the bottom line is going to be on that one. It is flat. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. A I bottom line it. may be flat. We'll find out <laughs> exactly. if the earth is. <laughs> All right. So that's it from us. What do you think about number stations and uh, the end result? And what it, maybe your theories about some of them? That'd be interesting. Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. Or you can send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. Please do share the podcast with your friends. Uh, I know many of you do, and we do appreciate it. So please, if you can, keep sharing the podcast and write a review in Apple's podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. I've been checking those out lately, and they're great. We, we so appreciate the great uh, reviews you get. Those help. Other people discover the podcast. All those things help us grow our community of listeners. And we're reaching more and more people every day with these great shows. So we really do appreciate that. You can find links to the resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Three, one, four, one, five. Three, one, four, one, five. One, two, three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, seventeen, nineteen, twenty three, twenty nine, thirty one. Say your prayers, you long eared galoot.